I, I, let me just, if I may, relate what I do to uh, where I'm going tomorrow. I'm leaving tomorrow to go to uh, Afghanistan. I'll be out there embedded with U.S. forces on the ground and, in some cases, co-located with Afghan National Army and Af Afghan National Police. And I want to give you, a, so you understand my perspective. I am a son of the greatest generation. Back many years ago when I worked for another network, Tom Brokaw's office was right next to mine up on the eighth floor of the same building we're in today. And Tom Brokaw had just written that book, The Greatest Generation, and my, my mom and dad were part of it. In fact, the cover of that book could easily have been my mom and dad. There's a soldier's trousers and a, and a beautiful woman's legs, and that was my mom. And I've looked back carefully, not only at what was in his book, but at that generation, as it influenced me as a young person growing up, and that's the message I've got for you, because that's, that is the message of this great firearms museum. The message is the legacy that has been left for the next generation. That's why this museum is such an important part of who we are as a people in America. And, and, and that's why that legacy that was handed off to my brothers and me influenced all of us, every one of us served in the military. Not because we're more patriotic than the next door neighbor, but it was part of who we are. It was part of who my parents were. Every one of my uncles served in World War II. The media today is full of stories about how desperate the situation is in Afghanistan. I mean, I, I had brought with me four or five different newspapers, all of which have a story either on page one or on the jump about how bad things are in Afghanistan. You could take the word Afghanistan out of the article, and two years ago the word would have been Iraq. Well, guess what? They won the war in Iraq. Soldiers, sailors, airmen, guardsmen, and marines of the United States of America won that war. And yet you would not know that from the media because as soon as the war turned around, they stopped covering it. And today, all the bad news is coming out of Afghanistan. I'd like to remind young people who didn't have that blessing that I did of growing up in, with parents from the greatest generation that in World War II, and I, I, I went back and checked because I knew I was going to be here tonight. I went back and checked on this day in 1942, the operation, the first American offensive of World War II. Remember, Pearl Harbor had been bombed seven months before. America lost every single battle it was in up until June, the Battle of Midway. Every single battle was a disaster. By, by June, when the Midway is won, there's a naval battle and a naval air battle. By June, Tens of thousands of Americans were dead, not just at Pearl Harbor, but all across the Pacific Ocean. You'd had Americans who were dying on the beaches of Dieppe, who were landed with the Canadians and the Brits in the, in the famous raid. You'd had a disaster going on in North Africa. And it was a total reversal of everything everybody thought was going to happen. It was terrible news. The battle for Guadalcanal was 20 days old today in 1942. 20 days long. When they landed at Guadalcanal, they expected it to be at max a 30-day battle. It was still going on six months later. There was, there was absolutely no one who forecast that America could be put in that kind of a situation. And yet, at the end of the day, 16 and a half million men and women serve in uniform in the armed forces of the United States. The nation mobilizes and we win the war. And make no doubt about it, there's, it would not have happened had the United States not gotten into the war. Europe would have been ruled by Hitler and Stalin, they would have parceled up, and, and Japan would have run Asia. Now, when you look at the way the news is being covered today, and the disparaging things that are said routinely by my colleagues in the mainstream media about those who serve in our armed forces, or those who support our armed forces, and I've met several of you who are contractors here today, that's the new dirty word in America, contractor. The media has figured out that the American people aren't going to do to these soldiers, sailors, airmen, guardsmen, and marines what they did to my generation that came back from Vietnam. The American people are not going to stand for it. And in large part, that's because of the extraordinary experience of, of these young Americans. That, that hasn't stopped politicians from denigrating them. We all know of certain politicians in Washington. I'm trying not to be partisan here. 
Mr. President, I, I, I don't want to be partisan, but we know that a certain Illinois senator, whose nickname is Dick, <laughs> excuse me, I'm just quoting him, he likened those who serve in our armed forces to those who serve Stalin, Hitler, and Paul Pot, and, and was, was immediately jumped on and makes some of these town halls that are happening now look like picnics, and so he stopped doing it. The New York Crimes and the Washington Compost <laughs> yeah. Describe him, and, I, and this, this again, this is how they started out. Nothing but poor kids from Mississippi, Texas, and Alabama, God knows why they picked those three states, who couldn't get a decent job or health insurance, so they joined the military because that's all we offered them. Now, I'm, I'm not bragging or complaining. This is my 16th trip to cover this war. Okay, I spend months in the field with these youngsters. That's not the description of the youngsters. Somehow, magically, these, these ne'er-do-wells and misfits don't show up in the units that I cover. And I've only covered 45 units in this war. That book out there, not one of those photographs is staged. Not one of those inches of hundreds of miles of footage that I've shot were set up. It's all the real thing. What's the difference? Here's the real thing. This is a word picture of who these youngsters really are. That's a battalion commander who just been wounded. We're standing in the hospital tent at a Ford operating base. They operate and maintain the most sophisticated weapons and equipment ever designed by the hand and mind of man. And the enemy they're up against, like this was a human being who stepped off the curb and blew himself to pieces against the side of that Humvee. The enemy intends to die in the process. Tell that barber you don't like your haircut, I dare you. <laughs> I was next in the chair, that's why I took the picture. <laughs> you know, Jim Land taught marksmanship and how to snipers for years. The good news is, these guys know how to shoot. The enemy that they're up against is so afraid of standing up to them that their favorite weapon has become the suicide vehicle and the IED. Because if you go in a gunfight with soldiers and Marines, you're going to lose. And they all know that. This was, a, this was a suicide driver who tried to approach a Marine convoy in Ramadi, Iraq in the summer of 2006. The Marines, there's a standard procedure that they use, part of the rules of engagement. They tell him to stop. He doesn't stop. They shot it in Arabic. It doesn't stop. Then they throw a flashbang in front of the vehicle. He doesn't stop. And he's still coming toward it. And they finally open fire at the vehicle. They kill the driver. The driver was a suicide driver, but he didn't know that he didn't control it. If you look very closely right next to the vehicle, you'll see a little white thing in the roadway. That's a robot that's about to go up to the car, stick up an arm, and look inside it to see what's there. And somewhere not far, now I'm on, I've just gotten out of the convoy, and I've gotten up on top of the building, and I'm standing there pointing my camera at it, and as the other bad guy with the control detonation device sees it, he doesn't want the robot to get too close. That's what happens. And that kind of thing happens routinely all throughout this place. This happens to be Iraq, but the same thing is going on right now in Helmand Province and Kandahar with young guys out there with one of the most difficult sets of terrain and climate and, and dangerous circumstances you can imagine. And I wouldn't take anything from any one of these guys. This is a nighttime operation outside in Anbar Province the National Police come in and said, hey, we've got an IED parked in the middle of the road. If you look carefully beneath the lights, you'll see the reflection. What's a 1975 Ford Fairlane station wagon? The National Police come in and told the Marines, hey, we think there's an IED in that thing. And so Marine Patrol goes out, we get up to the edge of it, we're about 200 yards away, I've got my camera rolling on it, and you can hear mortars being fired from somewhere. I'm deaf as a stone, but I can still hear mortars. And the sergeant says, the heck with this, let's get out of here, let's tow this thing. And I'm thinking, tow it? We're going to hook a chain to this thing and pull it back? No, a different kind of tow. <laughs> that's, that's the tow going down range. And that's the secondary from what was inside.